Hello, everybody. Dave Neal here, stand-up comic, and this is a Love is Blind finale preview. Love is Blind is airing right now, the finale episode this Friday, and we're going to have the reunion this Sunday, later this weekend. Uh, but before you watch tonight's episode, I've got a nice, long conversation with Dr. Diane. She's a friend of the program and discusses all things relationships as we see them on these reality shows. Now, we can't know exactly what's going on. It's an edited show, but Dr. Diane does a great job looking at which couples have a good chance at making it last, which couples have you know their toxic traits, the red flags, and all the different things going on. And um, I ask her the question, is love really blind? And how does uh, attraction play into love? Plus, we cover Jackie, Marshall, all the couples, their, their posit positive things going on, the negative. And uh, you're going to get a lot out of this conversation. Enjoy my chat with Dr. Diane. Ladies and gentlemen, so excited today for longtime guest of the show. Maybe the number one guest we've had uh, by now, Dr. Diane Strakowski. How are you? I'm great, Dave. How are you? I'm, I'm wonderful. It's nice to have some non-bachelor news to talk about. Love is Blind uh, finale is uh, today. We're recording this the night before on Thursday, but uh, uh, are, is love really blind? That's the question. And I'm going to like defer to um, Shake. I think it's blurry. Love is blurry. Yes. You know, when I was watching Shake, there's a million things you can not like about the way he sort of talked about his relationship. Again, this is a few seasons ago, but he kind of called it out. Love's not really blind. And, right? I mean, you you pick somebody that you kind of can reflect your, like, uh, I don't know, that, that you see beauty in, and then, and then the rest has to also fall in place. I think, you know, they have a tagline just recently on Love is Blind, something like falling in love is easy, which I agree. It's the hard part. It's the getting married part. It's it's all the rest that comes after that. But um, I think there's some good things to the show. I like some things about how it's laid out. Yeah, so Love is Blind, Bachelor, these types of shows, they have to have an environment that's conducive for love, which means no nothing else. It means no social media, no jobs. The yeah. can can you and I, I don't know if this is something you you cover, but can you talk about like what what the dopamine uh, dump might be when you hear somebody because they're 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 blind, so they're almost projecting what they want the other person to look like. Is that a good thing? Okay, so I'm gonna just clarify, Dave. The use of the word projection is not correct here. Thank you. Okay. So, um, projection truly. What does projection mean, Freud? the father of therapy said projection is a defense mechanism when I feel something and I project it onto you like a movie theater. Okay. So for example, a projection would be I'm cheating and my partner, and I feel guilty about that, but I project onto you that you're cheating. Okay. So I would say, Oh, who is she? Oh, what are you doing? Instead of owning my own stuff, I project it onto you. Gotcha. Okay. That's not what's happening in the pods. What's happening in the pods is I only have one mode of information of my five senses. I only have auditory, right? So I'm gonna rely on auditory more and I'm gonna create a fantasy of who I think you are based upon what I hear. And then I start creating a name and a face. I start dreaming about you, thinking about you, but it's more fantasy. And we could say fantasy projection than projection in a defense mechanism. Yeah, I've read recently that our eyesight is like our greatest sense. So much more. And of course, if you're blind, you can you 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 naturally can hear better, smell better, all these other things. But with taking away their eyesight, that is like only having a part of the coloring book out and you're just hoping to draw in the right areas. So, uh, but thank you for correcting me on the projecting. But yeah, it is connecting dots that might not be there. And I just think normally, say we were all at a bar, you would just quickly see all of the potential suitors. And then from there, what, you would almost pass that level so quickly that from there, all of the other things fall into place. So it's almost like, and we when we go back to Bachelor, when Zach on Bachelor took away sex in the fantasy suite, he made everything about sex. By taking away the idea of physical attraction, it almost made everything about physical attraction, which made it more messy when everyone got to meet the other people they said no to. Because now they're going, oh, shoot. They're like almost reimagining if that could have worked if they chose the wrong person. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's a lot going on here. I also think that when they say falling in love is easy, I do think that if anybody out there is dating 
and we know that dating is hard. It sucks. Um, that's why people sign up for these shows, right? Because if I'm going to swipe till eternity with no outcome versus go on a show and end up with a spouse in four weeks, hey, maybe that sounds good. But people take all of this energy. They do give up their phone, like on The Bachelor. Oh, okay. I gotta go all in. So I appreciate that. I should visit people season four. We have more people in their 30s. I really like that, right? We've got Brett and Tiffany and Kwame and Chelsea. All of them are in their 30s. And those are people who are a little bit more ready, shall we say? And I love on the show, Dave, that everybody lives in the same place. Yeah, that's obviously huge. Takes Most away the influencer yeah. move to LA type of mentality. Absolutely. So I think they're doing some things well. And I do also think that the factor of competition, right? When you talk about dopamine, what gets me kind of like excited? What builds my, uh, you know, my, my energy, my nervousness? It's when now I go back to the pods and, oh, Chelsea's your first choice too. Well, she's mine. What about so-and-so, right? So there's a little bit of falling in love. You don't know what they look like, but the easy part about falling in love is everybody's having their own little soliloquies, right? I'm telling you a story about me. I'm telling you about my childhood. I'm Marshall talking about my father who was harsh. All I have to do on the receiving end is say, oh, honey, baby, that's hard, right? And that feels so good because you've gone so fast in the process, right? I'm bearing stuff that I wouldn't bear on first dates and we're going deep fast. Yeah. Now, why it's hard then in the real world is because you also require things of me. It's not like I'm just telling a story and you're listening. Now we're in a relationship and that's different. But falling in love in the pods, because I've met cast from season two. I went to Chicago, met a few of them. They all say you really do fall in love. Sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Right? You're all in. You have no other distractions. You're having these long, complex conversations. You're just moving at glacial speeds that every day in the pod feels like a month in real in the real world. Yeah, it's in, 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 on all the different dating shows, they do have the sort of like how to fall in love on steroids. How do you do this in two weeks? Well, you take out every other sort of distraction. I guess I just wonder sometimes like the best way to start a fire is to like slowly introduce the wood and slowly breathe onto it, not just like smother it. So I wonder if, if there's any science to falling in love too fast, does it, um, do you paint those red flags quicker versus addressing them? And all of a sudden you're in the stupid condo they provide which I always find so like not warming at all and like do you pass up those those chances when you fall in love over a longer period of time to like address the little things well so here's the thing did you remember in 2015 the New York Times articles 36 questions to fall in love no okay you got to look it up I just googled it the New York Times had done a psychological study or at least it was posted in the New York Times where there are 36 questions to fall in love Okay, you sit in front of someone, but the whole idea is like, if I take a frog and I put it in him in a boiling pot, you've heard this, he's gonna jump out, mm -hmm. right? But if I put the frog in a cool pot and slowly heat it up, you don't even realize. And that's what happens where you kind of build on other questions. So in these 36 questions, you start out with high level questions. Like if you were to go to dinner with someone famous, who would it be? But as you're getting to the 36th question, it's questions like, if you died today, what would you regret? Wow. And you could see how you're progressively asking these questions. And what's happening in the pods is people, because they have time, they're getting to these questions. And here's the other thing. This is what I'm telling my clients to do. If you want to date, also because we're saying love is not blind, there is a physical element of it but then ask those questions of your date on the phone in between dates. Very you know interesting. Why? why is that? Right? Why Dave is otherwise on a date, I'm distracted by you, right? I'm going to kiss you. We're going to touch. It, it's hard to ask those questions, but when I'm on the phone and we have some distance, 
I can feel there was another psychological study done that people are more vulnerable in the dark than they are in the light. Wow. Plan your dates in a bar. That's so interesting uh, because, you know, uh, you know, being, living in Los Angeles, we get stuck in traffic for so long that some of the best conversations that I have with my wife is just us uncovering how we were raised, you know, like talking about how we were raised and how we wish our parents would have done this, but they did that. And it's really a product of just us being bored and have nothing else to talk about. So we still talk about those types of things that are like really I mean, probably conversations we've never really had with anybody else before. Right. Yes, absolutely. But there's, there is so much that we can get out of asking the right questions and having those, um, creating an environment and a space for those questions to really happen for sure. So we definitely see that happening on love is blind. Some people, are able to, I guess, develop their relationship better than others. Who do you think has the best shot at making this thing last? 100% um, Tiffany and Brett. Yeah. They've been hands down my favorite. They're both the most mature couples, right? 36, 37. Yeah. Both of them have, but they also have their lives together, right? Um, you know, Brett came from nothing. He is uh, works as a designer for Nike, right? He, he's got his life together. He knows what he wants. They both dated a lot. Tiffany, she, um, they try to make it look like there's conflict between them, but I don't think there is. I just think they're, they're, their partnering skills are really lovely together. She says, I'm stressed out. He says, come here. Of course you're stressed out. He comforts her. There's a lot of beautiful moments between these two, bringing in their families and friends. It's just, they're my favorite. And also like on an attraction level, they just look like they're meant for each other. They're kind of like just dead on perfect for each other from, from an audience standpoint. But like you said, when you talk to their ability to communicate, it's like yeah. home run. Now the opposite of a home run is a strikeout, which looks like Jackie and Marshall, but where on the percentage of fault do you put Marshall versus Jackie. Now, I always take the devil's advocate because everyone's slamming Jackie. And I'm like, well, okay, she can't be 100% at fault. So, like, where do you see uh, their relationship? So, David, of? here's what I think to summarize it. Okay. I, I always am neutral. Like, there's both people because it's a relationship and both people play in. So, here's the rub. And I, I summarize it as this. Both of them trigger each other in a very core way. Okay. Jackie, if you go to her profile on the second page of her picture, she says, and I wrote this down, I won't put up with someone who thinks they're better than me. Okay. Won't put up with it. She's a self-made person. She's a dental hygienist. She has a degree in dentistry and anesthesia or something like this. She's also like the center of her family. Her father has cancer. There's a lot going on. I don't think it was a good time for her to be on the show, but when Marshall, who also is soft and kind of sweeter, she's more outspoken. When he says you're a project with potential, that is her trigger. Okay. That is the trigger. And we're not recovering from that because that's not implying that she's self-made, that she's worked on herself and saying that you're a project is just fighting words. Yeah. The other trigger for Marshall, he said he was bullied for being emotional when he was young. Okay, he said that. I was bullied and I was made fun of for being an emotional person. She says to him, boss up, man up, that is the trigger. So now we've got two people triggered and because we know that doesn't work out and now there's been nothing but time and two people wanting to present their side to talk about what's happened. Um, some people have said that they thought Marshall was controlling because he was like, put the jacket on, right? When they're at Chelsea's party and she's like, leave me alone. And they're both just playing off of each other. And I think it's just not a good mix. It's not. If you were their counselor, if you were their marriage counselor, would you, do you think you could help them make it work? Could you, could they grow from this or is it better off to just like, just, just oil and water, you know? Well, I don't know if I could. I mean, it would take a magician, really. Um, <laughs> I say to people, like, listen, I'm no magician. Um, I think I'd have to say to Jackie, Jackie, listen, you thought that 
you tried something different. You wanted, you were hurt when Mar you thought that Marsha was out because you you see that, and she said, and she said to his family, he's sweet and he gets me and he's different, right? She tried to find somebody different than the bad boy, the six foot five tatted guy who she usually goes for, right? Basketball guy, she said. But Josh is more her type. And when Marshall wasn't leading with perhaps the aggressiveness, and she herself said in Mexico, I'm afraid I'm going to flip on you and that's not going to be good. And I think that's what's happening. But I actually hold them both accountable on this. I think Marshall, if you've watched all his videos lately, he's trying to say, I don't need an apology. Um, you know, it takes two. Don't judge us. I think there's stuff there um, where it's more, there's both sides, right? And I just think there's there's a lot for both of them. It would be hard for me to imagine them working. You know, I've been sharing a lot of that uh, saying you have. I don't want to butcher it, but uh, that, that you don't know what flavor tea you are until you drop it in hot water. I keep on saying that. But um, yeah, they face adversity and they yeah. get ugly. Now, um, assuming we take Marshall out of the picture, how does someone like Jackie grow from not needing necessarily a toxic version of love. Like where's the healthy side of that character trait that she has? Well, I don't know about Jackie enough, but I have said that I thought she's more on the attachment style, somebody we call fearful avoidant. There could be some negative childhood experiences that she's responding to with a lot of either anxiety or withdrawal. Like, Marshall's saying, what can I do to love you, Jackie? And she said, just love me. But she doesn't really say directly what that means. So Jackie really needs to do some healing. I don't, I mean, she said it herself. I'm not really looking for marriage, yet she went on a show for marriage, right? So yeah. he needs, and because her family's in crisis, I just think this is so not the right time, right? I, I really want her to just take some time, figure herself out, communicate more directly with what she needs because i think she gives a mixed message right like saying to marshall um just love me is not specific enough to how you need to be loved so how does it feel as a therapist to watch these i don't know gaps in their logic or ability to communicate because as a non-therapist it's frustrating to be like oh you guys are close you're just sabotaging it how does that feel watching this play out Oh my gosh, Dave, I can't tell you. I mean, I want to throw popcorn at my TV too. And I <laughs> and go, what the? Right? Um, I, I'm there with you. It's, and I feel like because there are so many tools to like get in there, it's like you want to fix it and like say, no, wait, do this and do that. And, and I really look at this even like the reunion, like there could be so many opportunities for healing if somebody just called out what it is. Like you triggered him and you triggered her, but two rights don't make a wrong, two, two wrongs don't make a right. Like, let's think about how we could heal this. And if there was that layer of healing, I actually think it would be helpful for the viewers because it's kind of like, you know, there's no trigger warnings. I get all upset about this. And like, I want to know the outcome. Like, was my time worth it? What happened to you guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like, it's this, the same problem I see with uh, politics. It's the wanting to dunk on others because your ego is on the line because it's broadcast in front of people. It's like if, a, if someone slapped me privately, I'd be offended. But if they did it publicly, I would have to respond. How am I going to take this? So the reunion will probably, my guess is, lead to not a healthy response from people because it'll be like people like fighting for their image. Some people were coming out and saying that Chelsea is love bombing Kwame. I don't know about all of that, right? Um, I, I think personally, Chelsea is very eager, right? She is all in. She said it herself. She was lonely. She really loves the idea of him, really wants to bypass this. And they respond to each other. That's what couples do because Kwame's kind of pulling back. He's a little bit more hesitant. She sees him flirting with Micah, right? To me, he doesn't look all in, yet she's kind of negating that. She's kind of like trying to talk him into it. It's going to be great. He's like, the first year of marriage will be hard. She's like, no, it's not. It'll be great. And I just feel like he doesn't feel heard. So to be honest with you, I think this couple with therapy intervention could really benefit more 
than like the Jackie and Marshall. I think they're just different. But I think Kwame and Chelsea, if there was like a slowing down and a cooling off and finding space for both of them, I would actually have more hope for them. Yeah, it almost felt like Chelsea operated from like a teacher student vibe where she was like, oh, this is how it's going to be. Like, this is how relation." He was like, oh, I have to compromise. She's like, that's what relationships are. And it's like, okay, all right. Like, like well, married, yeah, right? well, welcome to the club. Um, and then I guess lastly, we've got Zach and Bliss. That's our final couple there. What are your thoughts on them? think they're both going to say yes. Wow. I think um, I'm going out on a limb here. I, Zach really, you know, I warmed up to Zach, right? At first, right? He's goofy. I'm a stripper. Oh my gosh, Zach. Um, but he knew that he messed up. And I actually think he handled the breakup with Irina really well. So I also look for the positives. You know, they both said we tried. Irina like put a pillow over her head or something. We tried, it didn't work. And because he knew that Bliss was in the wings and here's the other thing, we don't know about all this timing. We don't know like how many times they met, all the backdrop to that, but they wanted to get her up to speed because other people liked Bliss, right? Like the women liked her. So they wanted to like bring her in that club. And I liked the way Bliss spoke back to her father. Yeah, she absolutely neutral and just, hey, dad. And she's thinking, hey, you divorced my mother. And are you going to give me marriage advice? But she seemed, I like that they're both nerds, right? They both appreciate each other's intellect. I just feel like there's a lot of nice grouping. Some people said they're not very affectionate. I'm like, that could be. And that's not a reason for it not to work. Yeah. And Bliss, I mean, she obviously felt a little wounded by Zach not initially choosing her, but like on Zach's defense, it's like, come on, I'm looking through like Ikea furniture. I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know what I'm talking to. Although Irina, of course, Zach's initial pick immediately over it in the flesh. Was that, do you think because of lack of physical attraction or was it that she lost that safe space to talk without maybe have, needing any sort of like, I don't know, a physical response like what like how do you think that whole thing you know blew up dave one trick if you ever want to see if a couple is attracted to each other do you know what you should look for what's that their feet okay watch a person's feet their feet give it away all the time i watched this carefully on the reveal zach's feet go like this and Irina's butt kind of goes out and her feet kind of go back too. physically. They were not attracted to each other. Both of them. They needed, I said, in a, they needed an eject button like, oops, this isn't it. But he wasn't into her. She didn't match the vision, the fantasy that he had. She immediately was like, oh, no. Right. And she called him a cartoon or something. Didn't like the way he wasn't blinking. I mean, this whole thing was awkward. Probably one of the most awkward reveals we've seen. And sometimes when people go awkward, they joke and make fun of things. And maybe Irina, I mean, cause she obviously came off very cruel laughing at situations and being mean girl. And, you know, I guess that comes from an insecurity maybe by taking, by taking away the blind aspect. It's like, now we're here in the flesh. Am I good enough? Uh, you know, comparing herself to the other women rather than, I don't know, raise each other up. She kind of just became a mean girl. Exactly. And I, I don't know, I can't speak to what's behind that, but, um, she did say that, you know, she herself was like insecure about her skin or all these other things. And sometimes it's like, I reject you before you can reject me. So I start like finding fault in you because I don't, it's hard for me to just come out and who wants to say, like, I'm not physically attracted to you. So people defer back to these like other you know, less direct kind of ways. It, it wasn't a good look for both of them, but they did call it. And I kind of appreciate that. What I don't want is, you know, we've already seen the deep D story, the choose myself. Like, did we really need to be dragged through this? And because there was someone else, there was bliss waiting in the wings. I think Zach got it together pretty quickly, realized his mistake. Privately, he's saying, I'll do anything I can to make this up to you. You've got to trust me. And I think as a couple, then it, it's sort of like they have a conflict to work over is to get over this. And we also know that sometimes they play up these connections to make us think it's a bigger deal than it was. Yeah. 
You know, I think one of the ways the show could evolve, and maybe they don't want to do this because maybe it, it uh, gets rid of the drama, but when they all meet up for the first time, there should be some like sort of blind vote where like if, if Kwame really does want Micah, then he just puts it on her card. And if she says she wants him and then it's like, all right, well, you both, you know, but it's kind of this like, are you into me? You know, like I'm ready to jump from this if you're ready to jump, but like you don't want to mess up what you already have. Whereas in the real world, you may have a month where you're dating two or three different people and then very quickly in most circumstances, the right guy, the right woman rises to the top. Dave, I'm with you 100%. And yes, they do it for drama. But here's the thing. If I get engaged to you in the real world, we're not going to go to a pool party and I have to be around my ex. <laughs> yeah. right? That's the part that I feel like if the producers really wanted to produce, and it's not even Netflix. I don't know if you know, it's Kinetic Contact. It's a different pro production team. But if you wanted to produce really healthy couples that made it work, you would put them in a bubble, protect them, and not expose them to other people because there's too much comparing and contrasting. Are you guys having sex? I don't know. Are you? What's going on? Like, like do I find your husband hot, your fiance hot? It's too much. That would not be real world. So that creates drama, but it doesn't help the couple. Yeah, you know, it's all, it's it's how I've been explaining Vanderpump rules. It's like if Bachelor in Paradise uh, all worked in the same restaurant and you couldn't date outside that circle. It's like, of course, you're going to expose yourself to so much toxicity. I mean, how nice is it to put on the old fashioned block button when you're done with a relationship? And in these circumstances, they they, they kind of they they make you they they fabricate your world so it's small enough that you're continuing to tempt yourself or question yourself and all that. Right. Um, and, and the good news is there's no ghosting. And, and the bad news is there's no ghosting, right? I mean, it's like you can't, there's no place to hide. And everybody on the shows has said that there's just no place to hide. And this is more like dating than you're ever going to do, right? I mean, it requires a whole different kind of set of skills to make it work. Yeah. And in some cases you have the right personality type to, I don't know if it's disassociating or what, but you can like take away that they dumped, that they chose someone else first and they're with you now or whatever the case is, just it'd be able to take that out of your brain and just move forward, which is very hard because we live in a sort of like comparison culture. Um, yeah. But we're going to have to get out of here because the show's going to air soon. <laughs> but please join us if you want after the, um, after the live episode or in the following days to see what we got right and um and all so that. dave let me add one more thing sure. okay i have one other idea about how the show could be better i watch a lot of reality dating shows and i have to tell you i do like the original married at first sight shows with the therapist okay so if i were going to redo these shows absolutely think about the intensity it's one thing to fall in love get engaged even but to be married in four weeks the amount of stress they're under if you got a therapist in there to talk about you know, hey, that's your fiance. Don't be talking to like if you got somebody in there, I really think these shows would would last for the long term. I do. I think we'd have higher success rates. The cast themselves have all talked about wanting to have somebody help them. I think the reunions we wouldn't be talking about Nick and Vanessa Lachey's relationship again. We'd be talking about like, hey, what happened there? So uh, that's my plug. I just feel like if we did a combination of all these shows, not had this long delay of taping, right? Did more kind of live, even have people voting. You could get people really involved and actually show some good stuff. Some yeah. Good yeah. Because on these shows, like you said, you, you, if you see a flaw in the relationship, I, I think you might assume it's the other person's fault versus having a therapist tell you, no, you're doing this wrong or you're, you know, you know, you're triggered or whatever. It's, it's hard to, it's hard for us to look at ourselves in the mirror and be objective with our own flaws. So when you get on the show, a lot of times you'll see a, someone else's red flag, but it might be something you caused. And, you know, I just, for the first time heard this term like twin flames or whatever, where like your partner exposes things in you that you need to work on. These are, I'm like Googling these terms. These are all new things for me but uh, it seems like the show at the very least when you get out of it you learn something about yourself from all of the criticism you receive and whether it works or doesn't yeah and i i still also want to protect people's mental health they go on there with good intentions right and some people whether they wanted fame or not or to find love and um to get all this negativity and critique uh, i mean it's a lot you have to be a really strong person to kind of handle that and turn that off um, and I, and, and, you know, people on these shows have, have done some, um, 
you know, some self-harm and that's been difficult to watch. So I, I really do feel kind of protective of these people at the same time. And how right? naive, uh, sorry, how yeah. naive for audiences to think that they do any better. I, I mentioned this the other day in a video. It's like people are snapping in line at Starbucks and you think you're going to do better. Like, let's be objective and understand we haven't been in this position. Yeah. And let's use our terms correctly. Let's talk about what's, what's really happening a lot of this, as I say, can be described by attachment styles. We have all these other negative words we associate. And I'm so careful about that because if we use, we overuse those words, we think everyone's a narcissist. We yeah. think everything gaslights us. We think everything is a red flag. And then how is the normal person going to go out and date when all you see is danger, right? There are those people, but even though they're there, the whole question that I ask is, how are you going to deal with it? Okay, yeah. you do run into a narcissist. You do have a red flag. What do you do? How do you respond? Is it a red flag you can get over or is this is a non-negotiable? Like you have to think about, it's not just spotting those things, but then what to do with it, how to handle it, how to then walk away quietly or see if you got it wrong. I've had other people be judged. I'm a narcissist. No, I'm not. I was just advocating for myself, right? So. It's very nuanced, and um, and I think we just want to slow down and kind of be careful. Well, we love your take on it, and for everyone out there who hasn't heard Dr. Diane Strakowski yet, you're on Instagram at Back to Love Doc. And anything else we can promote for you? You can find me on Reality TV Therapy. I also have my own YouTube channel um, where I do break these down, and I'm hoping to do a therapist analysis. Like if I were the host, how might this be handled differently? Um, because I do want to sort of help people kind of understand it more. But yes, find me on Back to Love Doc on Instagram. And my website is the same name, Back to Love Doc. Amazing. Thanks again for joining us. And we'll have to talk after the reunion to see uh, what other crazy things come about. Yes, perfect. All right, I'll cut it right there. Thanks again. I'll have to, uh, you know, I got to chop, I'll chop up the parts that didn't come out and um we should have a good full full podcast i'll have this first thing up in the morning and then i'm also going to have this as like the featured audio for the for the podcast version too perfect dave thank you as always i love this show i'm only bummed that like we don't have more you know successful couples really because i think at some point like the bachelor you just get the the good intentions at the start get watered down over time and then you get people just wanting fame right yeah, it's the, just a the shame. people that want to be on the people that don't want to be on the show are probably the ones that would be good on it and vice versa but yeah yeah but even, i love bachelor data even to th chime in because like they used to get i mean danielle who i know and and ayana they you know they used to get a half a million followers and now it's like you're not getting that anymore yeah so and you got to figure out platform and blah, 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 all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, um, we'll see how it all goes down, but yeah, this, uh, it's, I think this, it'll be, I think it'll be a busy weekend, especially after this, or I should say early next week, once Sunday night happens, I think we'll have several days worth of content depending on how it all comes out. I absolutely think the same. And don't forget to leave a comment. Let me know what you thought of this interview. We always love having Dr. Diane on the show. We'll uh, hear her reaction after the finale and after the reunion because we know it's going to be dramatic. We know it's probably going to be ugly and sloppy. It's going to be a melee out there. Um, and we'll have to see who wins. And by wins, we mean has productive communication and uh, all that jazz. All right, folks, more content coming your way right after this.